Hello, everyone. I'm Terry Moran, and we've got continuing coverage now. This breaking news here in Washington, D.C., in the case against former White House strategist and key Trump ally Steve Ban Bannon. A verdict has been reached in his case. Bannon has now been found guilty on both counts of contempt of Congress that he was accused of after he refused to comply with the subpoena for his testimony and a subpoena for documents by the Congressional Select Committee that's investigating the deadly attack on the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021. Uh, the prosecutor in her closing argument said that he put loyalty to Donald Trump above his obligations under the law, and the jury agreed in a very rapid a verdict. They spent fewer than three hours deliberating and have now come back with uh, two guilty counts, two guilty verdicts against Steve Bannon. So for more, let's bring in ABC News' Zorian Shah and former federal prosecutor for the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District of Illinois, my home, uh, Renato Mariotti, my, my uh, home state and homeland there. So Zorian, let me begin with you, however. Steve Bannon, Guilty on all counts. Break down what this means for Bannon and for the January 6th investigative committee. Yeah, so Terry, that first count is for failing to appear for a deposition in October of 2021, a maximum of one year behind bars. And count two also carries the same maximum uh, behind bars as well. Uh, and, and, you know, Bannon is, just to, just for a little background, he's a former top advisor to Donald Trump. He is seen as the mastermind to his rise in power. And that is why he is so important. That's why we're talking about him right now. The two charges are counts of criminal contempt because he refused to to appear in front of the committee, in front of the January 6th committee, and it could also hold a maximum fi fine of up to $200,000. So the committee wanted to speak to him because they believed he had information that, that, in, that he was actively involved in planning, in the logistics, in the fundraising of Trump's effort to overturn the election. Bannon's lawyer, though, he says that the charges were politically motivated. He said there were good faith negotiations over the concerns with testifying, and he said no one ignored that subpoena, and the dates were all in flux. The committee said they heard nothing from him until that first deadline had passed. And that, you know, his lawyer said that they were protected by Trump's executive privilege. Well, the committee came back and they said that Trump is no longer the president and that Biden is not, has not been employed, you know, for the last at least three years. Uh, absolutely, Zareen. And, and Steve Bannon was out there on uh, right wing social media, his own podcast, kind of bragging that he was defying Congress. And this is what you get for that. Renato, uh, we were just listening to uh, our colleague Jonathan Carl, uh, who says this is a significant verdict for the power of Congress to enforce its, subpo its subpoenas. The inside the courtroom say Bannon was stone -faced, faced when the verdict was read out. Uh, legally, what do these guilty verdicts mean for Bannon? And, and I'll ask you the same question for the committee. Well, first of all, for Bannon, this means between 30 days and two years in prison. So that's significant. Uh, I will also say that it does mean that there are, is a consequence for Bannon. I, if Bannon prevailed here, I think it would mean that essentially congressional subpoenas meant nothing because he took no steps whatsoever to comply with the subpoenas. In fact, he almost was waving a red, a red uh, flag at the uh, a red, uh, a red cape at the uh, at the Justice Department, begging for an indictment. He didn't respond by the deadline uh, to Congress. He didn't produce anything. He didn't comply at all, and really never shown any interest, even negotiate or engage with the Congress until a week before trial. Um, and that stands in contrast to others like Mark Meadows, who ultimately were not prosecuted, but pursued a more sophisticated strategy where they did uh, produce some documents like text messages and then filed a lawsuit, a preemptive lawsuit. So I have to say, um, you know, what this means is that certainly um, anyone choosing to defy con Congress is going to have to think about this going forward. It is a big moment, and I want to bring in our Jonathan Carl, uh, who is standing by as well. And just briefly, the prosecutor in this case, Molly Gaston, in her closing argument that succeeded in convincing the jury along with the evidence, she said this is a case about a man who did not show up. And our government, she says, needs citizens to show up in order to function. So this was a vindication, according to the prosecutor, of the of the, of the rule of law. Now. It's also an incredible saga. Steve Bannon, you know, who helped bring Trump 
uh, to the fore of national time. I mean, Trump was already famous, but it's for, for the political world and, and was kind of this Bengali in some ways of the ideology of Trumpism such as it is. And now he's headed perhaps to jail, if not for a significant fine. Just reflect on, on that Bannon journey and why. What did he think? What, really, seriously, what did he think? Well, remember, he's somebody who's already been prosecuted once and received a pardon from Donald Trump. Uh, he, he's already uh, faced a very serious brush with the law. But look, this is, he was the chairman, the CEO of the Trump campaign in 2016. He was, in many ways, an architect of that campaign. Uh, his, his brash, confrontational style, when Donald Trump had his darkest moment, the moment that he looked like the campaign was over in 2016 with the Access Hollywood tape, it was Steve Bannon that brought in uh, the four women that had accused Bill Clinton of, uh, of sexual misconduct and brought them right into the debate hall. This was uh, the way he operated. He came in as the chief strategist, uh, but what ran so hot that he actually ended up getting fired after just seven months but was back there again in, in Trump's good graces. And, and, and Terry, uh, most significantly, I think, here is as uh, Donald Trump lost the 2020 election and began all that we have seen that, that he did to try to overturn the election results, Bannon was right there uh, cheering him on from the outside and perhaps doing more, perhaps very much an architect of, of the effort to overturn that election, which is why he was one of the first uh, key figures that this committee uh, tried to subpoena or did subpoena. They wanted to hear from him. I want to just, before I let you go, talk about last night's hearing of the January 6th uh, Select Committee on those minutes, those hours that Donald Trump did not do anything after the Capitol had been stormed to try to restrain his followers. And I, and I wonder just what your assessment of, of what was accomplished by the committee last night was. And might as well throw in this question. Do you think Steve Bannon's going to testify now? Well, I, I think the Bannon ship may have sailed. I, I, I don't. I don't really. I don't expect him to testify. They, they, they issued that subpoena back in October uh, for the for not just testimony but for documents. Uh, the, the, as you know, this this case does not compel him to testify. It just punishes him for not testifying. Uh, it was widely seen that his offer to come in and testify, which he made uh, just at the, the 11th hour, was simply a ploy to get out of this trial and to avoid this day. Now, you know, even if he came in and testified live and under oath, uh, it wouldn't get him out of this. He's still guilty. Uh, so I actually don't expect him to testify. In terms of the hearing, uh, the, the hearing one of the more dramatic things that we saw and truly new things we saw were the outtakes of Donald Trump's video messages uh, from January 6th and more significantly from January 7th, where you saw the anger uh, as Donald Trump was basically bullied by his aides to come in and to condemn uh, the attack on the Capitol, uh, with his aides telling him that, that if he didn't, he would be removed from office, either through impeachment or by his cabinet declaring him unfit under the, under the 25th Amendment. That was the result of another very significant case, uh, the, the case over executive privilege and the White House records of the Trump administration, which went all the way to the Supreme Court in which the committee won. That's why they had access to those video clips. They were in the National Archives would have been under seal uh, for years and years and years to come. So Terry, I think both in that case, the, uh, the Presidential Records case, the National Archives, and this case with Steve Bannon, you see a legacy of this committee that goes beyond anything they actually reveal about January 6th, and they have revealed a lot, but, but, but a legacy that will, uh, that, that, that will affect future investigations of future presidents, of future White Houses, um, establishing, A, that you cannot simply defy a, a congressional subpoena, uh, that they do carry the force of law and you can be prosecuted if you do not comply, and that you cannot hide uh, behind ex executive privilege and assume that all your records will remain secret uh, if there is a compelling interest uh, for those records to be seen. Especially if you've been out of the White House for three years and the guy who had the claim of privilege is out of the White House as well. But that's yes. a great point, Jonathan. Thank you very much. The way uh, these cases, this committee has boosted congressional uh, powers to investigate and oversight. The Democrats may live to regret that. Uh, as we know, the House and Senate change hands. Let me go to ABC News Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Pierre, the history of congressional subpoenas and people defying them, you need the U.S. attorney 
to bring those charges, and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. In this case, the Department of Justice decided that Steve Bannon uh, should be prosecuted for defying the January 6th committee and won the case. Terry, to the Justice Department, this was a very simple case in this sense. It believed that the Congressional Committee had a valid, legitimate subpoena and that Steve Bannon was required, obligated to respond to it. And when he did not, it was a crime. Now, in these cases, you have to have a number of things to align. You have to have a Congress willing to, you know, ask the Justice Department to bring criminal charges, and then you have to have a department that looks at what Congress wants to do and be willing to go forward with a prosecution. And I think in this case, as you mentioned, the bottom line here is that Steve Bannon at every turn basically said, talk to the palm. I'm not going to cooperate. He did not appear for a deposition. He produced not a single document, not one. And basically, uh, his argument or the argument of his attorneys was that, oh, he was negotiating with the committee and that he might have at some point come in to testify if there had been some sort of court order. And the Justice Department said, no, you had specific deadlines. You knew precisely what you were being asked to do, and you simply did not do it. And they said that they were going to take him to court, which they did. A jury of eight men and four women agreed with the Justice Department. And to reiterate what um, I think you and John have been saying, uh, this gives the committee uh, a sense that when it has a legitimate subpoena that is put forth, that people who are the subject of those subpoenas had better think twice about simply ignoring them. Uh, great point. And uh, we should say, uh, people may be confused. Uh, the courts themselves issue subpoenas for witnesses and things like that, but this is a congressional committee that did so. And as we've been saying, this verdict, the ruling in the Supreme Court about the National Archives, shows that Congress does have continual robust power uh, to investigate. Pierre, thanks very much. Let's bring in Avis News senior investigative reporter Mike Levine. Mike was inside that courtroom, so tell us, uh, you know, this is obviously a, a devastating moment for Steve Bannon. What was it like inside? And that showed, I think, on the face of uh, one of his main lawyers, Evan Corcoran, who looked deflated after this verdict came, came out. But Steve Bannon himself actually just seemed kind of stone-faced. He, he didn't offer much of an expression uh, before the verdict was read, as there was a long time, maybe 10, 15 minutes, where everyone was in the courtroom and just waiting for the judge to come in so that the verdict could be, could be read. And Steve Bannon was sort of jumping between just staring straight and also just looking at his phone over, over and over again, I think, trying to pass the time until he learned his fate. Uh, on the prosecution side, they seemed somewhat relaxed. At one point, they were sort of joking with each other and laughing before the verdict was read. I think they had a sense of where this was going since uh, deliberations lasted just under three hours. And, and clearly, as, as you point out, the, the defense lawyer felt where it was going as well. Look, I covered trials for a long time. Sometimes the problem when you're a defense lawyer is your guy did it. Uh, you know, it is it, it, Steve Bannon treated Congress with contempt. Right. But I wonder about what kind of defense you could raise. Right. The, the judge did deny his opportunity to claim executive privilege or to say these were political trumped up charges because it's a pretty simple case. They, they called you to testify and bring records and you said no. Uh, but how did the defense try uh, to win this case and why do you think it failed? I mean, the defense's strategy here was clearly just to raise enough doubt in the jury that they would find him not guilty. Uh, they repeatedly said, here's a reason why you should have a little doubt. Here's a reason that you should have a little doubt. It was things such as uh, procedural things. They raised the possibility that maybe Chairman Benny Thompson, you know, the, the chairman of the January 6th committee, maybe he's not the one who actually signed the subpoena, that Benny Thompson's signature on the subpoena may not be real, and so therefore the whole thing is invalid. They tried to su suggest that that was a possibility, and because of that, they they should have doubt that that Steve Bannon actually had to respond to the subpoena. But clearly those strategies didn't work. Yep. Sometimes your guy did it. Mike, thanks very much. Let's go back uh, to Zareen Shah, who's been covering this case for us. Well, what happens next, Zareen? So sentencing is October 21st one month after the next committee hearings for January 6th. We just learned yesterday that there will be more hearings, plural.
taking place in September. That's what Chairman Thompson said. He also said that there will be an interim report, and the committee says those hearings will likely revolve around that. The big question, perhaps the biggest question, is will the Justice Department press charges against Donald Trump and the rest of his inner circle? We already know that Bannon has been charged and now convicted, and so that is the next thing that everyone is wondering right now, Terry. Absolutely. And although Jonathan Carl says the Bannon ship has sailed for the committee, he may want to show the court before sentencing that now he's willing to cooperate. Maybe that'll help him a little bit. Thanks to all for joining us on this breaking news. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.